So thanks everybody for coming to uh, lecture 10, I guess, in year four of the three non-credit lectures being put on by the I guess, UBSS Hempology 101 Club and the International Hempology 101 Society. Um, today's lecture is on uh, medicinal distribution in essence of cannabis in, in Canada. And uh, it's something that I'll touch upon Health Canada's regulations and the, the law to be sure. But for the most part, I'm going to really try and focus on groups and individuals uh, like myself that have tried to help people with medicinal needs gain access to cannabis. Um, so, uh, yeah, just a little bit of history. Um, there have been, for decades, really, um, people using cannabis medicinally in North America and growing it for their own medicinal purposes or growing it for other people's medicinal purposes or, or subsidizing others uh, as well. Um, to my understanding, there were um, few groups or organizations um, officially organized to, to do that um, in, in this country um, before um, I started working with Hempology. In, uh, well, I, I started coming to Hempology meetings in, in November of 1994, so they started over in Vancouver at that point, so I guess it's uh, 15 years uh, as of this month even that, that those meetings have gone on. And it took a couple months before I, I got involved. And uh, over in Vancouver, uh, Hillary Black was working at Hemp BC at the time and uh, was managing that store. And though uh, I don't believe she had uh, gone so far as to uh, create a, an organization and get a phone number, a pamphlet, it just became known that you could come to Hemp BC and uh, Hillary would, would help you out. Um, so when uh, we had International Medical Marijuana Day in uh, November 1995 here in Victoria, uh, we basically signed a pact, uh, you know, agreed amongst each other that we would uh, distribute and help people with medicinal needs. Primarily our uh, main, uh, I guess, members membership was coming from the AIDS community. People with AIDS were dying very quickly after being, uh, I guess, in, in infected. And uh, they were being experimented on uh, quite a bit with different narcotic cocktails, basically. And um, sometimes they die even faster with that. And so um, using cannabis uh, was, uh, in, in some cases, their only option to, to have any quality of life. And uh, so, Anyway, um, that was uh, going across the country and really a, a lot of the groups that formed um, were based in, in large part from uh, the AIDS community. And so, uh, yeah, we uh, got our pager and pamphlet and club going here in September 1996 and I went over to Vancouver to the Hempology meetings as much as I could in those days. And, very uh, soon convinced Hillary and uh, another young guy, Teo, to start up a club that was uh, called the uh, I think Vancouver Medical Marijuana Buyers Club. And uh, they began distributing for a while there. And then Toronto caught on. And my understanding is uh, a, a small group formed in the summer of 96 in Toronto. And as is often the case, not everyone got along. And within a few months, uh, calm had uh, formed, and I believe they uh, started in December 1996, and a few months after that, in April 97, um, the Toronto Compassion Club formed, and uh, those have been, since that year or time, the two main groups operating in Toronto. Both of them now have, I think, over 3,000 members and two stores, which is pretty awesome. 
anyway, um, Hillary uh, took off for a while and went to Europe and down to California to see what was going on down there. Unfortunately, in the meantime, Teo, who, who was a young kid just out of high school, couldn't keep it up. And there was this time period where no one was uh, uh, actively uh, uh, operating an organization in Vancouver. And when Hillary came back in early 97, she realized that it was time to, to, to do that. And so May 1997, uh, the BC Compassion Club Society got going. And so uh, that was uh, um, how, how the organizations got going. Um, how they operated, though, and how they uh, other clubs have operated since has been really uh, um, interesting to, to watch. Uh, when we first started up our club, uh, we recognized a few things. One, that people had a constitutional right to uh, use this medicine to basically um, determine what uh, medical treatment they wanted if um, their uh, constitutional rights were invoked by having a medical necessity. We looked at case law like Morgan Toller and, and, and uh, others. Um, the case law around, say, Jehovah Witnesses, where um, a Jehovah Witness can actually refuse a blood transfusion, even if their doctor tells them they're going to die without it and that they need this to live. Uh, they can say, no, uh, I uh, do not want to uh, have uh, a blood transfusion, and uh, um, their doctor can't do anything about it. The reverse constitutional uh, argument is that even if your doctor says that you are going to uh, um, do harm to yourself, if there is a legal treatment available, you have a right to request and, and to get that treatment. Unfortunately, doctors often will worry more about their insurance and, and their rights than yours and will trample uh, upon people's constitutional rights and refuse to um, do things uh, that are in the patient's interest. Um, and so um, it's, it's ironic that uh, constitutional issues are, are often um, uh, fought more in the doctor's office than, than in the court of law, where it's more about evidence. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of people uh, ha have a hard time establishing their, their right to, to various treatments that their doctor doesn't agree with, but you do have that right. And cannabis is you know, something that uh, uh, should be legally available, and, and it has been argued um, by uh, m m many, uh, that th that is the case. Um, actually, thanks, very Doc. Um, he's a master. Uh, starting with uh, really uh, J Jim Wakeford, um, because uh, you know clubs like 